My name is Charlotte Townsend Gold. It's been my huge privilege to curate this exhibition. Uh, my first duty would be to remind us all that the university and this exhibition is taking place on Musqueam unceded traditional territory. Now, our guest of honor, the owner of this fabulous thing, Nasui Sachs. Charlotte, could you remind people that uh, there's a beaker there if they cross that black line? So okay, please do not cross the black line. <laughs> this will be a very bad thing. Um, perhaps some of you could move through to this side. And there side. are two seats in the front if somebody wants to sit. Adam, why don't you put her, her papers underneath your chair? So this is okay. There are three chairs here. Don't be shy. Okay, now Suisa, Shawnee Casavant, who... Um, is chief counselor for the Hupachasa people. She comes from Plekut, where these salmon, fish, cavort. We hope they always will. She's the owner of this great thing, and she's going to share her knowledge about it with us, and she would be very happy, please, and hope that you will ask questions as they come up. Thank you, Sean. Great. Thank you, Charlotte. Welcome, everybody. And um, I'd like to say that, uh, acknowledge that we're on Musqueam territory also, um, to show respect for them. And um, what a great crowd. Thanks for coming out. It seems that there's a couple classes here and, and staff, some, some profs. So um, it, it's a good mix of everybody um, that's here. So thank you for um, having me here, Charlotte. So. What we're talking about is Tlitsa Pitham, the ceremonial curtains, and um, this one's mine um, that I own. And um, you might wonder who I am, so maybe I could start with just saying who I am, so yeah, so you have an appreciation of who this person is talking to you. Um, so my name's Nos Kosax. Actually, I have three names. I've got Nos Kosaks, Chakwa Sikwislam, and oh my goodness. <laughs> Help me out. Clopen up, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm just so excited to be here and have so much information to share. I have to get it orderly in my mind. So I have those Indian names. I'm from the Hoopachesset First Nation, and we're part of the Nuchanath Nation. I'm not sure if people are familiar with who the Nuchanath are. Yes, no. We're on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And as far as I know, in BC, we're the only people that are whalers. So, and uh, we live on fish. Everything about us is fish. So that more or less distinguishes us from other, other groups. And for the Nuchanath people, there's 14 nations. So we're one of them. We all have the same language group, uh, language, and there's different dialects in there. Um, our tribe is relatively small. Some of them are over a thousand people and ours is only 300 so we've got a pretty pretty small community and there's probably half of us that live at home on a reserve the rest of us are all over the place and uh, I come from the Watts family there and I also have roots in other tribes for the Nuchanath Nation and you clue it and it's a shot so um, I'm kind of a mixture from a number of different places. I'm the oldest child in the house that I grew up in, and my mom's the oldest too. So um, I'm the oldest female of the oldest female. And in Nuchanath culture, that's significant. We're pretty hierarchical, and birth order is really important. So there are things that I, I do in my family that uh, or because of who I am in terms of the birth order, who, whose child I am, and that I'm busy, that, that I do things. Because you can have the birth order and have that position, but if you don't do anything, I mean, you know, what, what does it all mean? So um, I'm active culturally, too. Um, I've spent most of my life doing... Uh, 
professional work. My background's in nursing. I'm a registered nurse and I have my degree in nursing. But I'd say for the last 20 years that I've been the CEO, executive director for a lot of nonprofit organizations and government agencies like the federal, provincial, and First Nations governments. <clears throat> I have a, a pretty good base of knowledge on Aboriginal issues in BC and in Canada. Um, my, my area of expertise is probably mostly around health, community development, and um, local government, and just bringing people along in terms of um, improving the quality of life for our, our community and others. <clears throat> So that's me, and um, I'm status Indian. I don't know if people know all the dynamics around our legal designation as status Indians in Canada, but I have a number. So that makes me have certain, <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? Yeah, we're the only people in the world that get numbers and have a card that says that we're that number and that designation. And that gives us certain privileges and benefits. And sometimes you can be a full, um, you know, your genetic makeup is, is all Indian and you don't get any status. So there's a lot of weird things that go on in terms of legalities and what the latest legislation does in terms of our identity. And it causes a lot of trouble, actually. And um, the reason I'm talking about that is because identity is going to be core to when I talk about the curtain, and I'm going to get to that. I'm giving you background information. So, do you want to talk? I want you to add that you also have taught here at UBC in the Aboriginal Health and Community Admin Program. This is Sally. <laughs> And she's one of my biggest fans. And I like working with her because I can do no wrong with this lady. And yes, we, yes, uh, I, I have um, developed a few courses in the healthcare administration program and taught them. And we created some really neat stuff. And the program is an award winner. And it, uh, it still exists. <laughs> yeah, be quiet now. <laughs> So thanks, Sally, for pointing that out. Um, I, I really do um, like teaching and um, sharing information, like making life easier for other people, like give them the shortcut, give them like the real goods on things so they can do their jobs. But you had your hand up. Yeah, I just have a question. What kind of privileges do you have um, with that number passed? <laughs> with the number? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> we get non-insured health benefits with that number and uh, that means that you can go to the doctor and when he writes a prescription you can bring it to the pharmacy and because you have that 10 digit number they will fill your prescription. The only thing is if it's not the right medication then you have to go back to your doctor and get a form that says that yes you can have that medication. So there's a lot of people. Can you imagine some people that barely speak English and they're going to the doctor because they're sick and they're getting their prescription filled, but then the pharmacist says, no, you can't have this. You have to get another paper and, uh, oh, make your way back to the doctor and then bring the paper back and, you know, explain everything over and over again. Do you think that most of those people are going to go through with that? Probably not, a lot of them. I know, I know somebody that doesn't. That would be my uncle. Um, <clears throat> But anyway, like, doesn't that sound amazing? You get a 10-digit card, and you get free medical. So you know all those people that say, how come you're so special? Why do you want to be so special? Why do you want this? Why do you want that? It isn't as good as it sounds. They make every effort to make sure that we don't get things easily and that more and more gets cut back. That includes dental care, but before a dentist will do anything, you have to get the work done, the an assessment done and you have to get approval. So imagine if you lived in an isolated place like a house it, like that's one of our nations. So it's out on an island and you have to take boats into town, you'd have to get a babysitter, you'd have to find the dentist that wants to take you because dentists will say, we don't take Indians. They do that. 
here in BC. They, they will tell you that they do not serve status Indians because we're a lot of trouble. And it's not us that are a lot of trouble. It's the federal government processing all of the paperwork for us to get those benefits. So yeah, we get dental. We get massage therapy and other alternative forms of medicine. If you belong to a band, with that card, and you don't necessarily even have to belong to a band. You can be status Indian and not belong anywhere, that, which is weird. Um, so with that card, if you belong to a community, there's a certain allocation for housing. And if you're really lucky, you can get on the housing list. It doesn't mean you'll get a house. <laughs> it, like, you know all those myths about Indians get free housing and such? That, if there's enough money, somebody gets one somewhere. Um, not always um, anywhere that I see. Sometimes people, it depends on the level of sophistication and development of your own First Nation. Some people are, get quite good at getting the funding and being organized in terms of meeting the housing needs of their community members. And others, um, they're just too late in line. And a lot of people live in um, quite disgusting circumstances in housing that's um, moldy or, you know, they don't have running water, etc. cetera. Um, and that's just the way it goes because in most of the Indian communities, there isn't anybody that's going to make you move out because um, that's just what you get. In my community, I can't live on the reserve. Um, there's no more land. There's nowhere that I can build. So I bought property in town. That's where I live. It would be prefer preferable to live where my relatives do, but um, it's a woodlot. There's a, a woodlot for um, logging, and that's what um, is left there. So that's one of the reasons that we're always sort of um, lobbying and being politically active to get more land because we're, we've run out in a lot of cases. Education, that card's supposed to get you education through the federal government. That doesn't always happen either. Um, there's a certain amount of money allocated, and if you don't apply for the funding, if you don't have the criteria, the, the whatever um, prerequisites for getting that education or um, if somebody just takes a little bit too long to process it, then you're just out of luck with that too. So the education, the housing, health, social benefits, I think you can get counseling too under that. And depending on where um, the funding goes to and who develops it, then you can get access to those kinds of services. Oh, and if you're shopping on reserve and you um, have a card, you're tax exempt. So those are our benefits. You know what goes along with that though, is um, when you're growing up, everybody treats you different. And in a lot of cases that means like poorly, that teachers don't expect very much of you, that people don't hire you, people treat you like you're an Indian. So in a lot of ways, um, there's a cost to having that card too, especially if, if you um, are dark and look like who we are. So, um, I'll, yeah, so I'll finish that one. So there are some benefits, but there's also um, the downside. I think our ancestors paid dearly for those benefits. Okay, so um, back to... Um, How about back to land? <clears throat> so for indigenous people, that's what we're all about. That's the magical thing about us is, well, when I'm home, I say I'm right from there. I'm not from anywhere else. My family's never been anywhere else. I, I didn't move there. I've been there and you know we believe that we've been wherever we're from since time immemorial that we all have our own creation stories, and that's where we're from. And um, so that's our history. And you know that Neutronith people didn't have written language, that we're an oral people. So that's how we told our history was through images. And 
these fleets of them, the ceremonial curtains, this is relatively new. When they started, I don't know if you've seen archival pictures, but in the longhouses, you often saw design work inside, like on the wooden planks. That's how these started out. They were part of the house, so that it would tell the story of the people who owned the house and their village. So all of these curtains around you, like that's amazing how much history is surrounding us right now because it tells the story of how many families um, in, well, in BC and farther away than BC. So there's stories on there about wars. Um, these ones with the, um, the swing, I think that's a swing one too. Oh no, it's got the rope. Anyways, those ones are, um, what it shows is a puberty ritual. And when girls reach puberty, there is a celebration, typically a potlatch, and that young woman is celebrated, she's taught, and the community comes out, and they, they're on a swing, like a ceremonial swing, and often there's a red cedar bark rope tied around the girl, and then the older people in her family, the ladies, will pull her back and forth, like swing her, and then what it does, it, it represents in a, ritual or ceremonial way that the girl is going from childhood to puberty, childhood to womanhood, and then of course she ends up landing as a woman and that sort of is a ritual around recognizing uh, where she's at in her life. There's a few of those, aren't there? So um, you can see how important that is to different families. And those curtains would be pulled out probably when any young females um, were, reach, were coming of age. So that would be a huge celebration. I think that says something about how we feel about females in our families. And it, it's an awesome way to um, help them celebrate that they've come of age. Sometimes the celebration would include a number of different, say, sisters or cousins, and if there was a few people who reached puberty at the same time, there would be a, a huge potlatch to celebrate all of them. So back to the curtains. For my curtain, and it's cloth, when, historically when they got to be cloth, Remember I said they started out being wood, like painted on planks inside the houses. Um, you know that the potlatches were outlawed, that we weren't allowed to practice our culture or do anything remotely similar to what it is that we always did. Well, to keep doing the potlatches, like to commemorate somebody's um, puberty or to name people, to memorialize them, or to uh, marry them. What they did was it, the people started painting the designs on cloth so that when the Indian agents or anybody else came around, they could wrap them up really quickly and put them away so that they wouldn't be taken or burnt. So that's why they started getting to be um, more portable. The interesting thing is that nobody ever stopped. Like a lot of people are, get really um, concerned that like we're losing our culture and they fret and, you know, get really concerned that maybe we, we've stopped doing things. But it's interesting that in most of our families, people continue to do the, the things that we've always done to celebrate births, deaths, marriages, etc. It's also interesting to note that when at the same time all of our belongings, all our precious things were taken away from us and either destroyed or put in collections throughout the world, um, that other people took our, our, our things, you know, because you can still see a lot of the, our ancient pieces in collections, museums, etc. And at the same time, we weren't allowed to have them ourselves. For my curtain, 
As I said, I'm Neutronic, so there's a Thunderbird design here, and that's um, pretty much generic to most of the Neutronic tribes. So that's the overall design. And there are two serpent heads on the curtain, and these represent sea otters or quack quacks. My, in my family, my grandmother's grandmother was named Puni'i, and we live in the Alberni Valley, right? So, and then the, the river goes down to Barclay Sound. The um, lady, like that I'm talking about, the white people called her Polly, and there's a piece of land near Port Alberni that's named Polly's Point after her. But she had the privilege of um, owning all the sea otters and in the territory. And whenever anybody got a sea otter, they'd have to give the right shoulder of any pelt to her. So that was what belonged to her. And everybody recognized that. And there's photos of her sitting on um, a cedar bark carpet at potlatches. So this just shows that um, I come from that, that I get to say that's, that's where my blood comes from, is that lady. And more than that, uh, Puni'i, you know when European settlers came into the valley, they didn't bring their doctors or midwives or surgeons, so Often it was our people that helped them to deliver their babies, to uh, heal their bullet wounds or um, heal their broken bones. And Puni'i was one of the people that knew how to do that. She was well known as a midwife and she could do a lot of the um, heal broken bones and, and do a lot of healing for people because there was no doctors there. So she would do a lot of that. This is a dorsal fin of a whale. I was mentioning that my Indi one of my Indian names is Chakwa Sikwithlum. And what that means is, it's a name from Euclid. And like I say, we were whaling people, right? So when a whale was killed, the first thing that would have to happen is that the hunters would cut the dorsal fin of the whale off the whale, and then they, there would be rituals around decorating it, perhaps with eagle down um, and other um, things. And then they'd put holes through it and then carry it on poles to the chief's house. So it shows respect for, for that chief of that village and um, that that chief should have a part, that part of the whale before anybody else touches it. So my Indian name means all of the ritual that goes around that. So it means that, that uh, the meaning is everything that goes along with that ritual to make sure that that chakwasi goes to the chief's house. I got that from my great grandmother's sister when I got married. I built a house up near Clicoot in Port Alberni, and uh, there's a Sprout Falls there. It's chock full of fish in a good year. So those, this is representing all the fish that we have access to in some of our streams in Port Alberni. And I come from a family that's really serious fishermen. If there's fish in that river, they get it, and they'll get the most. And they never, ever stop practicing their Aboriginal rights. A lot of my cousins, brother, my dad, they've spent time in jail, and they were always at the epicenter of any protest um, that happened in the Alberni Valley around curbing our fishing rights. They never stopped. I mean, they used to be called poachers, but um, they were at the helm of uh, asserting our rights around fishing. How are you guys doing? Does anybody have any comments or questions? Can, every, can anybody have a, have a screen? 
story? I mean, that's just a... Good well, <clears throat> this is what you'd have to have to have one. Okay. First off, you'd have to know how to make one or know somebody who knows how to make one and that they would do it for you. And that you'd have to have your history because if somebody was going to paint, sew it for you and paint it, they'd say, what do you want on it? So you have to know a little bit about your own family history. And you'd have to know what rights and privileges that you have. Because if I put this up and it was wrong, if I had, I don't know, I, I can't think of anything, um, a squirrel. <laughs> I don't know. I, say it was a squirrel design on there and I hung it up at a potlatch say we were memorializing somebody, and there's another family that said, hey, squirrels are ours. That's our history. We got these famous stories about squirrels. Everybody's got squirrel names. We got squirrel songs. It would be totally appropriate for that family to say, we want time on that floor. And then for them to get up and say, we don't know why you have squirrels on your curtain. Why do you have squirrels? That's ours. I don't think you have any right to that. End of story. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you can say, no, well, uh, you know, I was actually adopted by the, the people that have that squirrel family. Or, so you straighten out your history in public. And if somebody sees that something's wrong and they've got backup for what it is, then you can straighten out your business right there. So that's what I mean. You have to really know what you're doing in terms of who's helping you and who puts your history up there and the images that you have a right to. Secondly, or thirdly, whatever it is, you have to, uh, what are you going to do with it? So if anybody said, I, wanted a, I want a curtain, I want one of those screens like Shawnee has, then you'd say, well, what are you going to do with it? And then so then you'd have to say, well, I have a baby, I want to name that baby. Well, what rights do you have for names? And do you have the wherewithal to gather your family and hundreds of people and entertain them and feed them and make sure that your business is all right? That you're doing the correct things? And those things take years. Like, I named my son, that was the reason why we had the curtain made. When he was 12, we gave him an Indian name. So. That took two years to plan. I had to invite my family from all over the West Coast to come and eat with us to say, this is what I want to do, what do you guys think? And these are people that maybe I didn't see much, maybe some of them I did, but they're going to tell me what to do or suggest to me how I'm supposed to implement this and what names could I give my son and uh, am I okay doing it? Like would they say, excellent, you're doing the right thing? Or would they kind of look at me strange and say, why are you doing that? You know, kind of thing, so. I spent most of my pension from a job I had working for the government when I named my son, because it really is quite a, a deal to invite several hundred people. I think there's about 500 people that came to um, his potlatch and I mean, you're feeding them, usually lunch, dinner, snacks, drinks. You're entertaining them, and um, you're thanking them for coming to the party. That usually means shaking their hands with 10 or $20, recognizing all the dignitaries in your, in your crowd. So I, so I guess the answer is, yeah, anybody can have one. <laughs> <laughs> if you get all that together and that, and that your family wants you to do it because if, if you're not going to have your family behind you to do something then what's the sense because you can't do it by yourself you can't stand all alone and there's a lot of pictures out front and you'll see that in front of the curtain you'll often see the family lined up which, which is quite a neat thing because at most of the potlatches that we have as I say, we're quite hierarchical and birth order is really important. So you'll often see like the oldest in the family here, then the second oldest, third oldest. But then in between is their offspring in order as well. So it's kind of neat because 
Sometimes you don't even know who's related to who. And then you'll be at a potlatch and you'll say, oh, I didn't even know that was a brother. <laughs> or I didn't know that that was a grandchild or whatever. So it really is something to teach us about who we're related to and who belongs to what. I think I answered. Yeah, I Excellent, thank you. Shawnee, have you used the curtain after that again? Yes, this curtain's come out um, probably, I would esti estimate 10 times. And it's mine, but I know that it's not just mine. It, uh, it would be silly of me if somebody was having a potlatch, say my cousin, um, and they, she doesn't have a curtain. And say she's calling that dinner together and says, I want to name my grandchildren, the, and I want your help. I need to know what to do. Well, that would be the time when I would be a good relative and say, if you don't have a curtain, you can use mine. Uh, same with my brother. My brother didn't have a curtain, so he used it. When my grandmother... On my dad's side, there was a memorial for her. We put this curtain up. Um, my uncle, my mom's bro youngest brother, named his child, my cousin, and he used this curtain. My oldest uncle, who um, his son got married, and my oldest uncle, he's oldest in the family, he has a chief's position. He doesn't have a curtain. Well, he has one, but he doesn't, he doesn't have access to it then. It didn't have a design on it. So he used my curtain then. And it was a really, I mean, with him being in a chief's position, it was a really big deal. He had three curtains up. Um, other people's, like my Uncle Ron's curtain. And there was, an, I think, two of my Uncle Ron's curtains and mine. Because it was a huge haul. And, I mean, to add to the prestige of the event, I mean, it just was quite grand looking and was appropriate. Um, oh, uh, I have a, a relative-in-law that's actually from Musqueam, and when she got married, she asked me if she could use the curtain. So um, that's not, well, yes, I was going to say that's not what, what her culture is, but pardon me, it is. She, her roots are from the same tribe that I, that I am from, so she was totally appropriate in asking to use it and to show she would demonstrate to all the Coast Salish relatives that she has that she, look what she gets to do. She gets to use this because that's where her grandmother was from, from that same tribe that um, this curtain came from. Would you talk some about how images can be added in future? Yeah, that's a, a good one. Um, how images can be added in future. I'm trying to think what was added. I saw a picture of this curtain and I thought this was dirt. <laughs> I forgot that we put it there. That's my son's handprint um, that we put on there. Um, I have a son and he's going to get married next year to a lovely girl and I'm hoping that sometime they have a baby and then I would have a grandchild. And when that grandchild gets a name, we'd bring out the curtain and there would be a, the opportunity to put something else on here. And maybe something that would designate my son too. His Indian name's Kwisahe and what that means is uh, a man, a man who knows how to, how to not only go get a lot of things like uh, food, seafood, hunting, whales, like he knows how to go get that stuff. And not only does he know how to do that, but he knows how to distribute it. So he would know that the chief's house gets the dorsal fin of the whale first, and he would distribute whatever he hunted or got in terms of resource properly. So I, we could have an image of him up there too. And there's lots of room, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't complain if we put more designs up there at all. And we could put more history if we wanted. <clears throat> As Charlotte mentioned, I'm the elected chief for our First Nation, a political position. And 
one of the things I've done, I haven't been in office for quite a year yet, but one of the things I've done is I facilitate a, facilitated a better relationship between neighboring tribes. The previous elected chief um, really facilitated quite a bit of hatred. There, politically, in the town, uh, it, it was getting really bad. So, um, and it hurt a lot of people because we're all related. Um, it, it was very stupid and it, like I say, it was very hurtful. So I've done a lot to facilitate the, the tribes getting along and working together versus being split apart and played against each other by the federal and the provincial government and putting us, um, cheating us out of opportunities that we could have had if we had have not had that um, split between us. So I would feel quite comfortable if, if my uncle offered to um, paint something that would represent that I got roots in both the Hoopacheset and the Tishot tribe. So I think that would be good. I'd be, I'd be pleased to have something like that. And as long as I ask nicely and, um, and it doesn't seem weird, I think I can get almost anything I want on the curtain. <laughs> and you would add to it. Did you want to say something? Would you, would you use the same office? Yes. That's something I learned when I was doing things, um, helping with potlatches, or when I named my son, is that there's a whole bunch of people that know a whole bunch of things. And people know different things in different families. And maybe there's ways of doing things in certain families or certain tribes. And what people will tell you when you go and ask them for help is they'll say, you can do whatever you want. But you have to listen because you might do the inappropriate thing. You can do it if you want, but there's consequences um, for what you do. So you really have to listen carefully to see what people are really telling you to do. One of the things that I learned is stick with who's helping you. Because if you listen to one person, and you're going to go a certain way or do a certain thing, and then you say, oh, this other one said they could do that for me, and then they do something, then that other one is going to back off, and they won't be there for you to finish whatever it is that you started with. So you really have to be careful about who you're working with and who you're talking to and what you're going to go with, and pick people who love you and um, that you trust to guide you with what, what what you'll do. And that's part of the process. It's you have to choose who you're going to work with and who's going to stick by you. Some of our people get really vicious <laughs> about um, some of the cultural things. Like, you know, they'll use it to put people down or hurt them and say, you're not allowed to do this. She didn't do it properly. Look what she did. It's all wrong, you know. That, she's going to be cursed or something because of that. Um, so it's good to just have your, your reference group, your family, the ones that care about you and say, nope, you're doing it right. That's the way we do it. doesn't matter what anybody else says. That's what we do. And then that's where you get your strength from. Did you want to say something? Yeah. Does, does that mean that every family has an artist who does this? Or do different um, people who do the curtains work with different families? I think um, my uncle who did this one, Ron Hamilton, Kikan, he's also known as, <clears throat> he's painted probably the majority of the curtains on the West Coast, and he just knows how to do it, and he does a nice job. There's other people that do them, and I don't think they're in every family, and I don't think everybody does a really nice job. so. No, there's, there's not everybody in every family that does it. I think whoever does a really good job and just sticks their neck out and does it, they do it. And then if people want them to do more, then they do more. But if they are sloppy or they don't do things correctly, then nobody asks them anymore. Yeah. Oh, just a sec. You and then Scott. Well, 
There's a lady in Port Alberni at an upholstery store. My uncle's trained her to sew these, so she knows all the specifics about where the grommets go, what kind of hem he wants, what kind of fabric it is. And um, a few times I've seen people, they think they need canvas to make it, right? So, um, and that's really heavy. And then it gets ridiculous because that thing weighs like 100 pounds or whatever. And it's hard to pack around and it's hard to manage because somebody has to get up there and put the hooks on across a big hall and all of that. So. This lady's been, she knows how to make these curtains. So yes, you do have to pay for the fabric and you have to pay for her to sew it, unless you know somebody who can do this. And um, there's specifics around it. Like I say, if you pick the wrong fabric or perhaps if you didn't have it hanging just right, it might look stupid or it might fall apart, I don't know. So you really have to know what you're doing and listen to whoever is gonna paint on it and finish it for you. Um, Remember I said when I was getting ready, I called my family together. Uh, I didn't know that I, if I could have a curtain, somebody said, well, do you, I think my uncle said that, do you want a curtain or do you want to use mine or whatever? And I'm going, well, can I have a curtain? <laughs> he says, well, it said all the same things that I've just said, you know, like, what do you want on it? Can you do this? Whatever. And so, yes, I, he painted the curtain for me. And um, you don't really pay people to do things like that. You um, might thank them. And you can buy them gifts and at the potlatch maybe recognize them, stand them up and say, this is the artist, this is the one who did this, thank you very much. And maybe give them a gift of cash. And then if you have something that they love, um, maybe a new shirt or a beautiful blanket or some piece of artwork or whatever, then that's the gift for them. And it's not really seen as payment, but a thanks. Do you want to say something? But just a minute. <laughs> You're next. Sorry, Scott. Um, I want to ask you if, if the curtains um, can be used or are used in, I guess what I would call a political occasion, or rather than just a family occasion. Yes. Let's say an important court victory or something court case is won, and you were the person who won the case, would you, would you show the curtain on the formal occasion? Yes. Around that? Yes, because it's our history and it shows something significant. I don't know if you've heard of, uh, there's five tribes amongst the Nuchanath, they call themselves Manils, and they signed a treaty, and it's going to be implemented. So there was a huge celebration in a huge hall in Port Alberni, and it was very cool because all of the chiefs who had their curtains, they were all up, all around the building. So it was a, a, a beautiful decoration and a declaration of what they own and who they are. So it kind of showed all their grandness uh, right out in front, you know, and because it, the celebration was about them, it was about them, their families, their communities, their tribes, and it was like right there in everybody's face. It, uh, it made for beautiful photographs. And yes, you could bring it out anytime you want, I think. if. Um, I know my brother brought one out when uh, there's a school that Sashot First Nation has on their reserve, a grade one to six, I believe, or K to six. And when there was a celebration at the school, he, he had his curtain out for them. And of course that would, you know, if his children were there, his grandchildren were in the school, then it would add to the, the um, just the specialness of the occasion. So yeah, you could use your curtain probably for anything you want, it's yours. But again, if I wasn't sure, I'd ask. I'd ask my relatives and say, should I bring my curtain out? You know, and then they'd say, yeah, that would be really good, or maybe you shouldn't. When you're bringing, I'm just gonna add one more thing, and I know you, want, you have a question. Um, when you do bring your curtain out, like it, it really is, you're creating a space and it's, um, I mean, this represents people's history, right? It's their family, it's, it's uh, what they own, and often nobody touches them. 
Like, it really is uh, criminal to see if you have it up at a potlatch and there, say there's somebody who has no respect and they're handling it and, you know, they're kind of roughing around. You just kind of go, leave it alone. Like, don't touch. <laughs> you know, and they obviously don't have any manners. You know, they have no respect or no regard for what it is that that is, what the curtain means to people. And you can bet that they don't have their own. <laughs> You had something you wanted to say. Yeah. I noticed that on the curtain down there there's a sort of like a European style ship. So I wondered if artists were introducing things like ships, trucks, chains, or, I mean, other things from everyday life that aren't usually associated with traditional life. With a ship on that Well, yeah, that's part of the people, that family's history. Um, people have amazing histories. There's one family that, um, it's, been, it's been written up in our local newspaper, well, our New Chonath newspaper. There's a family where one of their members was hung for a crime that he never committed. So uh, it's been brought up a number of times and there's a poll raised, um, I think, in their community where they're commemorating that person and all of their family and they've requested <clears throat> that the provincial government apologize for, for killing their relative um, wrongly. And uh, so that would be on their, their curtain too. Like, and that's a huge piece of history, right? There's another uh, family that they can put their landmarks on it so say between the Euclid First Nation and the Tleoquit First Nation, people generally accept where the landmarks are. So if you're out on the water and you line up, say, points of land, they'll say everything on that side, that's ours. Or um, what, what a lot of people in Port Alberni, from my tribe, were told, go stand outside and everything you see, that's ours. <laughs> So, you know, if we had uh, mountains on here, like the Barclay, um, Beaufort Range, or um, Kuskachut, the Aerosmith, like, you can put representations of what it is that your family, what you belong to, or what belongs to you. I think you could put anything you want up there, really, as long as, it, uh, you know, your family or whoever means something to you says, yeah, that's a good thing. And like I say, you can probably do anything you want, but there's consequences. So if you put something silly <laughs> up, then probably people would wonder, yeah. Neil has a question and so does Charlotte. I was gonna ask, uh, each of these curtains has its own story, right? Um, the, the the front story and the back story, and I was wondering how comprehensible, how legible those stories are to people who are not the owners of the of the curtains. I mean, is there a kind of a graphic language that is common to some of these, so that you can, for instance, look at a different curtain and know that what what is taking place, or is it just because you've maybe heard the story? from those people? Mm -hmm. I think that you need to have somebody interpret what it is that you're looking at. And uh, yeah, you can kind of guess at some things, but I'm thinking um, my uncle has a curtain on display at the library, I think it is, and there's a big frog on there. So um, if you didn't know what the story was or what the history was, you'd just see a frog and say, I guess frogs are significant you know, to that family. But there might be a whole legend or a history or an event that happened in the family that they would explain that to. And I was mentioning that I, I brought my curtain out 10 times and I haven't had it that long. Um, and there's other curtains that have been around for generations. So if they've brought their curtain out 100 times, then that's 100 times that people over generations have heard what that curtain means. And so if you were at four potlatches where they explained over and over what that curtain means, then you'd really know that um, that family owns that thing, the squirrel. <laughs> and, and 
you've never seen anybody else talk about squirrels. Um, so you would learn what, what that means. And the curtains aren't that commonplace, like everybody doesn't have one. So you, you would get to know who's bringing them out and not every family and every person has potlatches or can host feasts where they're bringing out curtains in their history. <clears throat> so the more they come out, the more you learn what the history is. And it can be interpreted by the people who own the floor. You're there at their invitation. They own like the space that they're speaking from and that they're hosting and that they brought everybody together. So they get to say what is. Charlotte. Yeah, I mean, here in this space, we can see the curtains there, and they've been up for a couple of months, um, which is rare, because normally they are brought out for a particular occasion. I wondered if you'd talk a bit about the protocols of, of displaying them versus in the way keeping them not inside but out of sight when it's not the do. And how long that period might be. It might be years, right, when they're not when they're not brought out. So people might be interested to know how they're folded away and looked after and kept sure. out of sight because they need to be protected. Mm -hmm. out of view. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will say, like I remember um, one of the questions that people were asked uh, about their curtains during an interview was, when was the first time you saw a curtain? And people would go, oh, I saw my dad's. You know, I remember when I was really young and my dad brought it out. And then it's like there's a hush because they're opening the curtain. And it might be the first time a whole bunch of people have seen it because they haven't brought it out before. or. Um, I think this is the one that the Peters family belongs to. Is that the one that they were talking to today? Um, the Peters family from Bamfield area, they've never seen that. They've never been in its presence. That's their family's curtain. So you can imagine how, uh, what an impact that would have on people to be near it and say, oh my God, you know, like th this is from generations ago. This is ancient. This is before Europeans arrived on our shore. Can you imagine all the things that it was brought out for, you know? So <clears throat> what I have for my curtain is one of my relatives made a really nice wooden box. So it's a wooden box with some copper detailing on it. It's got a really neat rope handle and it's got some shelves in it because when you put this curtain out you need all of that mechanism the um all the metal stuff and the wire and then there's a a thing uh, a, a winch or something because you can put it on one end and then you can tighten it up and um, there's a few extra screws in there and i think a screwdriver and so my son and a few other people know how to put the curtain up. And you know what? You, if you're at a do and somebody's monkeying around with things and they don't know what they're doing, it looks really sloppy, right? And it, it looks poor. It looks like you don't know how to handle your own things. So I love that everything's in a kit. It's all put away and it, it's safe. It's not going to get dirty. Somebody's not going to put a cup of coffee on it or you know, stand on it or walk on it or something. It's a way, it's safe. And I know that when I go take it out again, it's going to look like this. <clears throat> Most people will put it away safe so that they know where it is and they can go get it out when the occasion, when they have the occasion to use it. And they're handled very carefully, typically. I'm not sure if that was all you wanted to hear about how they handle them. They store them. People might not see them for a long, long time. Should I talk about why I named my son? <clears throat> OK. Um, growing up in Port Alberni, Port Alberni is a small town, loggers, fishermen. You can bet that it wasn't so pleasant growing up there being Indian and going to school. There's, you know, it's, people are racist sometimes. And um, so 
Not everybody knows the good side of us and not everybody recognizes the value that we have, the history that we come from, all the beautiful things we have access to that nobody else does. And the fact that we are right from where we come from, right from where we usually are. And uh, my son's fair, <clears throat> his dad's of European ancestry, but you know, you can still hear the words, you can still hear the slurs, you can still hear the things that are negative, especially in the media, in movies, on the streets, wherever you go, in meetings, at school, at university. And uh, I wasn't always taught, how do you respond to that? How, how do you not just want to cry every time you hear ugly things about yourself. It is yourself. They can say Indians this, Indian that, but it's yourself that hears that and absorbs the ugliness. So I wanted my son to have uh, protection, to have the answers, because when you know how to respond to things, when you know the truth, then it doesn't hurt as much, <laughs> because you can say things that say, that's not true. You can say, any, you can say that, but I know different. Too bad, you know, Go to hell. Um, so I wanted him to have a real secure idea about what's good about him and who his relatives are and to know the truth about us. So that's the truth about him and, uh, and what it means to be Hupacheset, what it means to be Nuchonath. So the way to do that is to make sure that he knows his relatives and that he knows he has an Indian name. So, so um, nobody could say, what's your Indian name? And he'd say, I don't have one. And say, what kind of mother does he have? <laughs> you know, so that identity is really important. And especially at puberty, you know, teenagers are just forming their identity at that time. And they need something that makes them strong. So I really wanted him to have that background, to have that feeling of being connected to something great, to know that um, he's important, to know that he's special, that it isn't just being part of the lowest rung in society that, that he has, you know, that the lies to just listen to. So that's the truth is that um, he knows he has a good name. He knows he has a grand aunt that made his name for him. He knows that how many hundreds of people came there to see him, to see who he is. I mean, he was only 12 and he was a slouchy kind of a pouty boy. <laughs> but guess what? He took it in. He knew what was going on. He knew that hundreds of people came because he was getting a name. And, uh, and he had been part of everything going up to that. He had to help serve. He had to help cook. He had to learn who, who was who, you know, learn his relatives' names. And one of the things that I was really proud of that he knew how to do, when we're having a potlatch, the host will usually stand up there and they'll call chiefs' names and they'll shake their hands. Well, one of the jobs that the young guys have is they take the money and they go to the person and give the money and shake their hands. So he knew how to do that. And you have to know everybody's names. You have to know their Indian names and you have to know how to be, you know, stand tall and do the right thing because not everybody will do it. And you know, he's only 12, 13. So that was a neat thing that he knew how to do. He, know how, he learned how to be because if, uh, you go into an environment that you're not familiar with, you'll be awkward and um, not be helpful. Well, he knew how to be helpful. And that was a, a really big thing for me. He was, was comfortable in the environment that was ours. Because, well, he's the artist, he's the guy. And I was mentioning that about the not so swift time we had in high school in Port Alberni growing up in the 70s. <clears throat> and then here was my uncle, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr. Radical, Mr. American Indian Movement, goes against the grain. He was the first one with really long hair and he didn't wear shoes and he was hippie-ish and he talked back. <laughs> he did not conform. <laughs> 
and he was like Indian right in your face. No, no, no ifs, ands, or buts. So that, that was a real boon to me. And the other kids that were around, you know, like being in an environment where you felt oppressed and not valued and pushed aside, back of the room, but you, that you got somebody who's right there. I don't care if people want to push you in the back of the room, they'll be there anyway and be at the front of the class or, or um, leading things. So, <clears throat> How are we doing? How's your son doing? My son, I am so proud of my boy. He, he, he wasn't the easiest kid in the world. He, his stories are hilarious. Some of the things he did when he was a little kid are just a bit crazy. But anyway, he, um, he was always contrary. If you said the sky's blue, he said, no, it's not. And um, he always had to do things his own way, stubborn. <clears throat> but what I always admired about him was he he would suffer the consequences. So he might choose something that nobody else wants him to, and he'll just do it, and, and if it's wrong, too bad. He'll, he'll, he'll go with it. But anyway, he, um, he, he graduated from school, and he went right into cooking school, and he's been cooking in high-end restaurants around the world, and now he has rented a space in Gastown, and he's going to open his own restaurant there. Yeah. So um, I'm very proud of him. He lives a good life. He's a hard worker. Um, he's learned from the best. So couldn't ask for more. He doesn't hurt people, and he, and he feeds himself. So <laughs> he's a good boy. <laughs> yeah. How's our time? I have... Would you like to have a break? Can I come talk mm -hmm. about this evening? Can come back for more? Sure. Okay. Well, I'm going to... Thank Naskui Sachs right now. Um, I think we should also acknowledge that Chush Kamakni is in the audience, known to some of you as Kikein, some of you as Ron Hamilton, the maker of this and many other curtains. It's an honor to have you with us, Ron. <coughs> um, but you have another chance today to listen to Shawnee, perhaps in a, in a different context, and who knows what else she might come up with. Um, we're just at the beginning, and in fact this is a sort of introductory um, event for this major uh, symposium that Neil Sophia here Neil has organized, Itineraries of Exchange. And uh, this evening, after the reception, there's something called Global Indigeneities, views from near and far, and Shawnee is one of the views from near, and that's taking place at the Longhouse in the First Nations House of Learning at 7.30, between 7.30 and 9.30 this evening, and everybody here is most welcome for a second, a second dose. And, uh, yeah, the other presenters are, look fascinating too. There's something about cannibalism in there. <laughs> <laughs> Go for the sensation, <laughs> won't you? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, please join me in thanking Shoni for sharing. Thanks, everybody.